Thanks a lot, Craig. Thank you. Very grateful to be in this beautiful library. Uh, thanks to you all for coming out on a, on a nasty evening. I do hope um, that we'll mostly have a conversation. Think about questions you might want to ask as I'm speaking. I'll try to keep my prepared remarks short, uh, read three short passages from the book, and then, uh, and then let's talk about FDR. Uh, a funny thing has happened to the public image of Franklin Roosevelt since I was a kid, and since I suspect you were kids. When I was six or seven years old, the very distinct memory of my grandmother telling me a story. She was a school teacher. She taught music in the Detroit public schools for many years, all through the 30s and 40s and 50s. Dedicated New Deal Democrat. And she said, Jim, I want to tell you about a great man, a heroic man who had polio as an adult. Now, I knew about polio because I'd had the sugar cube, right? The vaccine. I knew what that was about. And it was scary to think of a grown man who had polio. She told me how um, he had to struggle across a stage to get to a podium, walking with canes all by himself. And this was an act of great courage. And that was Franklin D. Roosevelt, and he became our president. And that stuck in my mind. And the other day, uh, a friend of mine came and told me a similar story. He said, uh, about a guy about the same age, he said when he was six or seven years old, uh, he came to his mother one day and said, Mom, I know what God looks like. And she said, is that right, Jack? How do you know how, what God looks like? And he pulled out a dime, and he says, it says right here, in God we trust. <laughs> and here's his picture. And she said, um, that's not God, Jack. That's Franklin D. Roosevelt. He had polio. Now, he was on the dime, right? He was on the dime because of the March of Dimes. Congress decided after Roosevelt's death in 1945, they wanted to put his face on a coin, and the appropriate coin was the dime. Because of the March of Dimes, the great campaign to fight polio that was put on by the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, which had been founded by Franklin D. Roosevelt, even before he was president. Polio was completely associated with Roosevelt's name. Every year when he was president, on the president's birthday, there were dinners all over the country to raise money to fight polio with the president's picture on the poster. People knew he had polio. They may not have understood the full extent of his disability, but they knew. And yet, what has grown up in the last 20 years or so, I would say, is a belief, especially among younger people, that somehow this was all covered up, that there was a great deception about Roosevelt's disability. I heard this again and again while I was doing my research, quite to my surprise. People would find out what I was doing and they'd say, isn't it amazing how that was all covered up? How could they have done that? How did the people not know? And <clears throat> the, the fact is that this is a great misconception. Um, I found as I did my research, in fact, that Roosevelt, as he made his comeback, found polio to be crucial to his political identity. And in fact, I argue in the book that it's at least plausible that he became president less in spite of polio than because of polio. This was the greatest comeback of American political history. It was not a deception, but it was a kind of performance. And so, I'm trying to get this point across as people start to uh, get introduced to this book. This is an important part of the story. And I thought what I would do is read to you three passages about performances that FDR made at crucial points during this period from 1921 uh, to 1933 when he became president. Uh, he became ill when he was 39 years old. Summer of 1921. Uh, the previous summer, 1920, he had been nominated for the vice presidency on the ticket with James Cox, the governor of Ohio. They lost to Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge, but Roosevelt made a spectacular campaign, uh, made a name for himself nationally. He was absolutely the rising star of the Democratic Party in the prime of his life, this vigorous guy with this great political name. And then that summer, 1921, he became ill. Within days, he not only couldn't walk, he couldn't even stand up. Everyone assumed 
that his political career was absolutely over. No one could imagine that, that a man uh, who, who was paralyzed from the waist down could ever again run for any significant political office, let alone the presidency, which had been his great driving purpose. He was determined, however, that he was going to come back. No one believed him. No one credited this idea. Not his enemies, not his friends, not Eleanor Roosevelt, although she certainly helped him and, and thought it was good for him to believe that he could make a comeback because it would encourage him to exercise, take care of himself, be vigorous, be a part of public life. <coughs> but he built himself up through exercise, constant exercise, week after week, month after month. First his upper body, uh, doing exercises, pull-ups, um, that, that built up his shoulders, his arms, his chest. His whole, you look at pictures before and after polio, you start to see this muscular figure appear where before there had been this rather lithe, slender guy. And by 1924, he was at least ready to make some public appearances. Now in 1924, FDR was allied with Al Smith, then the governor of New York, uh, probably the most charismatic American politician of the 1920s. Amazing figure, pulled himself up from the city streets, uh, had, had dropped out of school to support his mother in the seventh or eighth grade. Charismatic, funny, vigorous, the hero of the cities, Catholics, immigrants, the wets, the people who opposed prohibition against the forces of the dries based in the uh, south and the west. So Smith invited FDR to nominate him for the presidency in, in the summer of 1924. The convention was going to be in Madison Square Garden. This was Smith's home turf. Roosevelt was a popular patrician figure, and Smith felt no threat to him politically. So he invited FDR to give this speech, and FDR said that he would. He had to rehearse for it. He had to practice for it. He was scared about his ability to make this appearance, but he committed himself to do it. So let me read to you this first passage. Again, it's in Madison Square Garden, and uh, the, 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 the hall was absolutely jam-packed. Smith had uh, tons of supporters, local supporters, tough guys who thought Al Smith was the greatest thing that had come down the pike. And the previous event in the garden had been uh, Barnum and Bailey Circus, so the odor of the animals <laughs> was still very much in the arena, and it was hot. It was very hot in July. Through the hanging pall of tobacco smoke, delegates and spectators alike could see two men lift Roosevelt by the arms and carry him up the flight of stairs from the floor to the speaker's platform. The crowd quieted to watch. Now Roosevelt was standing at the top of the stairs. With his right hand, he held a crutch wedged under his armpit. His left hand held the arm of a teenage boy. This was his older son, uh, Jimmy. His fingers dug into my arms like pincers, Jimmy said later. I doubt that he knew how hard he was gripping me. The heat was awful, and sweat rolled down Roosevelt's neck. A moment or two more, and the crowd heard Roosevelt's name announced. Delegates fixed their eyes on the man whom they had first seen at the Democratic Convention in San Francisco four years earlier. In the summer of 1920, he had been, quote, a young man in the flower of his manly vigor, as one reporter put it. At a key moment that year, he had pushed opponents aside to seize the standard of the New York delegation and rush it forward to signal praise for the stroke-stricken president, Woodrow Wilson. Soon afterward, the hall had nominated him for vice president. But now they saw a different figure, thick in the shoulders and chest, but flimsy in the legs, the body oddly straight. He turned to the boy and took the second crutch, and he started toward the lectern alone. Recognize this story? This is the story my grandmother told me, the 1924 convention. The Roosevelt's friend, Francis Perkins, sensed a collective shiver in the hall, a sudden sorrow over this public exhibition of what had been lost. There was a hush, and everybody was holding their breath, she recalled. Everybody was sort of weeping inwardly. The old line politicians even remembered him as a very vigorous young man at the previous convention. And here now was this terribly crippled person getting himself to the platform somehow, looking so pale, so thin, so delicate. He reached the lectern. With both hands, gripping the handles of his crutches, he could not 